Oh, the broadcast live. is live. So we're live, Nick, and we're a couple of minutes early. This will just give people a chance to get on and uh, for us to sort of get centred in our positions. So anybody who does come on, if you wrote in the comments uh, what your name is and, and where you actually are, it's always great to see where people are listening in from, the different people who come in. And you, uh, you said to me just before it's been a long day. <laughs> it has been a long day. Um, look, it's been productive, but it's been a long day. I'm um, lo looking forward to the next two days, actually. We've got some really exciting rites of passages for our Year 12s uh, tomorrow and Friday. Fantastic. So um, I'll share a bit of that. Oh, Great. and there's we've Sue O'Connor. We've got Sue from Bishop Druitt, so that's nice. <laughs> well, Sue's the director of uh, the World Being Hub. <laughs> ah, my friend Thomas McKinnon from Harvey Bay. Fantastic. So, so Thomas, who who works up there, or Tom, uh, was part of the Butchler program that we did with the Aboriginal oh, Hub up there yeah, on Fraser Island. On yeah, in the, where, yeah. Uh, the Sandy Strait. Actually, looking out at Fraser Island. So great to have you here, Tom. Hi, Tom. Well, I know Harvey well. Bay very well. Pardon? <laughs> I know Harvey Bay very well. Yeah. And Peter Lennon, who's setting up programs in Canberra at the moment, which is fantastic, from the Mental Health Foundation and the ACT. Great to have you here, Peter. Anybody who's coming on, it'd be great if you um, just write your name and where you're listening in from. It's always good to see who's here. We'll get going in a couple of minutes. We'll just give people a chance to, to come in. We just uh, I was just finding out a little bit about Nick's big day. And what, what, you're a walker. Did you walk this morning, Nick? I did, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, um, my dog and I ventured onto Sapphire Beach this morning and uh, saw a couple of dolphins. It's pretty tough living in Coffs Harbour. <laughs> saw dolphins. Was there surf down there this morning? Uh, not really. It was pretty flat this morning. There was a little swell, probably about two or three foot. Um, yeah. No, no one trying to surf at Sapphire, but um, it's got to be the right angle, the right swell, uh, and the right breeze for Sapphire to work. I have actually had some beautiful surfs down that way, including at Sapphire Beach. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever I drive down the coast, I, I usually look for a surf somewhere in the area. And one of my favourite places is Ar Arawara. There's a point. Oh yes, right there. I had yes, some beautiful my surfs there. Brother-in-law and his family um, are involved in that. Hi, Michael from Geraldton. Good to hear from you. And I see Chris, Chris is a friend of mine from us in school box there. So there's a few people. Great. It's always nice seeing people that we know coming on to these talks. Jess from Paul Macquarie. Okay, we'll give it one more minute and then we'll get going. It's just getting dark here in Byron. Um, Quite interesting. I was in Melbourne last week with my father, and uh, it gets dark significantly later there, probably 45 minutes or so later. We've got Sean from PLC. Um, he's in the PLC, dad's uh, group at PLC. We've started a fantastic, well, not we, they have started, I've been involved a bit, a fantastic program with the dads at PLC, getting really involved, and, and uh, we had a meeting earlier in the year i are hoping to get about 20 people and i think 70 or 80 fathers turned up oh, and wow. it was you know high energy and lots of enthusiasm there are about 13 different events that have been planned in, including a father-daughter camp next year and uh we did a, a father-daughter online zoom last week and we had something like over two nights 500 uh fathers and daughters on the zoom which was tremendous so it's, uh, it's fantastic to see what can happen when it's not only a school who's providing activities, but parents get involved and uh, do really positive things. Parents can be a fantastic resource. Well done, PLC. Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Especially like to thank you, Nick Johnson, for joining from uh, Bishop Druitt College, principal of Bishop Druitt College in Coffs Harbour. I know you've had a long day. I know that pretty much every day you have these days are long. 
And, and I'd like to uh, start tonight by paying my respects to the Indigenous people of the land where I am currently, uh, which is in, um, I'm in the land of the Bundjalung people of the Arakwal Nation, and um, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And, and I know that the land where I am here outside of Mullumbimby, um, there was some significant work went on. So uh, it's very special to be here. Um, and I'm, um, I'm speaking to you from Gumbanya land, um, a really active and strong uh, nation here in Coffs Harbour and Ginnagay, which is welcome. Great. And Jingiwa, which is welcome up here in, in our part of the world. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, Nick. It's really special. I, I've known you for about seven years since uh, you invited me over to Geraldton when you were the principal of Geraldton Grammar. I came over there. We did some uh, great work over there. And then um, not long after that, you moved to uh, Coffs Harbour to take on the role of principal of Bishop Druitt College. So... I'd like to start just by giving uh, our audience an opportunity to hear from you briefly. You know, what's sort of been your journey that's then ended up with you being the principal of Bishop Druitt College? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess I've always seen my um, uh, calling to be in regional or rural education. So I started off working in science and then decided that wasn't for me and went to education and um, taught for a long time in Queensland in a, in a, um, a little school, which is now a, a school of over a thousand kids, um, St. Luke's Anglican School. I was there 21 years, did a whole bunch of different roles there from a science teacher and PE teacher through to um, year level coordinator, house coordinator and love that experience. It's a fantastic school. Um, and then um, Became a deputy principal there, head of middle school and curriculum, and then decided that uh, my calling was in um, trying to make some, I guess, significant change from the administration side of a school to have those bigger impacts. So I decided I put my hand up and look for a principalship, and uh, an opportunity arose to um, to go to Western Australia, and I took it with both hands. And um, fantastic community in Geraldton, wonderful wonderful town about four and a half hours those people that don't know four and a half hours five hours north of perth um in the midwest and then um four years ago made the trip to coffs harbour at to bishop druitt college so and it's a wonderful team we've got here as well i've been blessed with having um staff and school communities mm -hmm. uh really receptive to growth and change uh, and that has made um my journey exciting it's let me let me do a lot of really um amazing things in my, in my career and to be honest uh Aunt, i've loved every second of it fantastic fantastic we just had a little freeze there on your uh your your picture so hopefully that'll just be a temporary thing and and for people joining us please uh in the chat if you write your name and where you're from it's fantastic to see where people are joining us from we've got people from lots of different places in Australia or, or, already. Um, and Nick, when I look at the, uh, the, the website, the Bishop Druitt website, the, the first thing that stands out is that right next to the picture of you, there's a statement which says, the student journey at BDC is more than a collection of exciting educational opportunities. It is a transformative experience. Uh, and then you also talk about uh, your belief that it takes a village to raise a child. Um, and I, I'm really interested, especially starting with this idea of it being a transformative experience. How, you know, what does that mean for you and how did you come to that um, conclusion? Um, I'll start with a story, I think, probably. Um, I was talking to a, a parent today who came into the site um, had a bit of a, a chat about how their how their child's going, and she mentioned to me, um, and that the young lady's now in year ten, and she started at the school in kindergarten, and she actually used the wo the word transformative to me. She said it's it's been more than what we expected when we signed up on the dotted line, and we've loved the whole process, and it's been transformative for our daughter. 
And I thought, oh, wow, that's pretty good. I'll use that tonight, I thought. <laughs> um, look, it, it comes down to being inclusive, I think. Um, we're a really diverse community. We've got um, a, um, a slightly larger than our, our percentage population of Indigenous students in our community. This area in Coffs Harbour was a resettlement area for um, Sudanese and um, uh, Iranian refugees. So we've got uh, quite a number of refugee families in the school. And then um, regional New South Wales, like other areas in Australia, have a variety of different people from different cultures and different language bases and different religions. So the fact that we're really inclusive um, helps. And that's not something that I've brought to the table here at the school. That was here when I arrived. So that yeah, was a well, really... It, says it, it actually, apparently you've got students from more than 45 countries represented, 33 different languages and uh, 20 different religious groupings at the school, which is really quite extraordinary. When you consider we're an Anglican school and you'd kind of expect most people to be Anglicans or Christians, um, that's not the case. We're an open um, school. We're inclusive. We make sure that um, we feel as though everyone has a place and school should be a safe place for students. Um, yeah. Whatever's happening in their life outside, they should always be able to come to school and feel welcome. So I guess that transformative process for me comes down to the people that you have on the campus. And I'm talking about staff here for a moment. Um, it, you talk about the practices that you offer within your school and then the environment or the places that you put them together. So it's that uh, people, practices and places um, and how those three things merge together make that experience um, rich and dynamic, exciting and I think transformative. Yeah. Well, let's talk about transformative and, and community because you know the the title of our uh discussion today is transformational education and it's right there on your website about transforming and, and you know our belief that um two of the key things in transformational education are building strong healthy communities uh and creating rites of passage at key moments but i'd like to first of all talk about the community side of it and, and, and having um, students from, you know, 45 countries, 33 different languages, 20 different religious groupings, how do you create community in that sort of scenario? Um, love to hear some of your thoughts about that. And, and just before you answer, I'll give you a minute. Think through there that um, just want to also welcome, we've got a few people from, who, from Geraldton who remember when you were there. Uh, we've got... Kino from Byron Bay, Donald, uh, who I know from Sydney's joined us. Um, getting a good bunch of people from around the place. So Nick, yeah, community in such a, how, how do you build community in such a diverse environment? Before I do that, Anne, I'll give Shell Crawley a, a shout out. She's my next door neighbor. <laughs> so you never hey. know who you'll see online. Um, it, look, uh, those, um, those practices, um, are very important. So making sure that uh, students feel as though they have ownership over the school, staff feel as though they have ownership and parents do as well. To get ownership and to create that sense of belonging, you really need to, in my belief anyway, create an opportunity where everyone can be heard. Um, so that student, that student voice from a student perspective and um, having staff buy-in um, and then an opportunity for people to tell their stories, to share successes, to share challenges. Um, that's very important. The education program itself, to be transformative, um, has to be engaging. Um, we, we have practices across, across the school that are targeted all about engagement. So, for example, in our in our young younger age groups, we run um, a Walker Learning program, which is all about creating opportunities in the in the day for the kids to still play, to still engage, to still experience things. As they get older, we have a lot of choice in our programs. Just from like year five through to year nine, kids can choose subjects. They can 
um, have choice. They've had choice in the design of those subjects even, as have the teachers. Uh, so we run programs um, called Kaizen and World Options right through from stage three or um, year five through to, to year 10 or stage five. Um, so those things are very important. Um, having a vision and having a really good team to allow that transformation to take place. Um, while a vision is important to come from a principle, it's, it's almost useless unless you have a really good team around you or you can have the ability to build a good team around you. So I've got some outstanding staff, whether they be counsellors or chaplains, um, my director of student wellbeing, um, stage coordinators, primary coordinators, they all fit into that jigsaw puzzle of making, of having staff that can engage with the students to make sure that they feel valued. Um, and if they feel valued and they have a student voice, then they'll give to the process. Um, and we all want to have a sense of belonging, and that's a big part of it. Um, and then from there, together, we've built those rites of, uh, rites of passage through the school. There were some things that were in place before I arrived, and we've kept those. We've held on to those tr traditions really strongly, but there's others we've developed over the last four years in that, in that journey. And, um, and Arne, you've been part of that, that, that journey with the school through the Rites of Passage Institute to help us as a team develop those um, skills, to develop those awarenesses of what's important in the school and then build some traditions and some rites of passage opportunities throughout through that journey. So it can be transformative. Gosh, there are so many things that you that mention in, in one answer, Nick, and, and I want to sort of just <laughs> come back because it's so important, you know, community and, and, and good teams and making sure that we get enrolment um, from the not only the, the um, staff but also from the parents and from the students and, and, and uh, research is showing that more and more the student voice uh, mm. is, is really becoming part of what's going on in schools. And I think back to when I went to school, there was no student voice. Um, and so I'm very interested in that. And uh, one of our first elements of a rite of passage is in fact sharing stories. Uh, mm. And so I'd just like, I'd love to hear just a brief story or example from you, just whilst we're on this topic of community, you know, what, what's an example of a, a specific event or something that you've done at the school um, that you feel has contributed to the community? And I imagine you have many, but it's just one you'd share with us. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch, but um, I probably one that I'm most proud of in the last few years, I'll, I'll say it's it occurred just prior to, to COVID where we could still do some outdoor e education um, together with Rites of Passage was um, some year, year four and year six camps. Um, and that's where um, staff were trained in, um, in Rites of Passage, um, doing the level one course at, at, at the Institute. But then they came back to the school and they had an opportunity to debrief that experience with other teachers in their area. And then they sat down with some, um, some students in the, uh, the student leadership group um, at year six level. So this is primary school kids. Wow. Um, and they fed back into um, with the teachers to develop a program um, that then was delivered with uh, year fours and year sixes in mind in a new event um, and then we invited parents to be involved in that and it involved what I thought was an amazing honouring ceremony. So we're out, so picture this, we're outside, we're in a little township called Glen Ray on a school farm. It's pitch black. Um, the fire's happening in the centre of the circle and around the outside where you can see silhouettes of uh, light flickering on people's faces they're sharing personal stories about how they're honouring their 11 and 12 year old. Um, and that moved everyone there. Um, and that was an unforgettable um, moment for me. The staff, um, the students and the parents, we all shed tears 
but we all saw the strength and the power of um, the ceremonies involved in a rites of passage, and that was just one element of it. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah the, and, then when, and then when the kids came back, we made a point of celebrating their return, and that was important too. Um, I've got loads of examples, but that's just one little snippet of um, one particular event. I mean, tomorrow um, and Friday we have our valedictory um, events, and normally we'd have parents on site, but we can't because of COVID rules at the moment. So we're doing a combination of some videoing and some live streaming so parents can still feel connected. But we have a whole host of little, tiny little things that the kids really look forward to. I mean, a lot of schools have a guard of honour and that's beautiful. Um, and that cannot be undersold um, to kids about the importance of that event. So at, at the end of their um, their time in school, they walk through a guard of honour from kindergarten right through to the year 11s and all the staff. And you ask any kid in the school, they know that that is a significant event where they are being celebrated um, as a year 12 student who has gone through their entire journey. And we have about a quarter of our kids that are lifers. That doesn't sound like a great name, does it? But they started as five-year-olds and they're finishing as 18-year-olds. Um, it's very, very emotional. Um, one of the other um, uh, events that we have within those two days uh, is that the house tutor uh, who has been with that group of kids from year seven right through to year 12 gets to share their thoughts in front of the school community about how that student has grown over that time period. Um, it's very public, it's beautiful, and the the teachers aren't afraid to shed a tear publicly. Um, they are just stunning events. Wow. It's like, this is like a dream. You know, we came in and, and we did some work with your some of your staff and then we actually did a retreat up here with your leadership around rites of passage and to hear all of these things that you're doing. And just for anyone in the audience who doesn't know, um, an honouring, which you mentioned earlier, Nick, is when someone has an opportunity to tell someone else what they admire about them, what they're proud of, what they love about them. And one of the most beautiful honourings that uh, we see is when parents tell their children, especially if they do it, you know, great to do it publicly so other people witness the things they love about them, the things they admire, the, the gifts and the, and the talents and gifts that they see in their children. And, you know, it's like it's like watering a plant. You know, the children just, you can see the children grow and, and you can see emotion in the parents. And to hear you doing those um, honourings at, at the camp around the fire and then to have the, the tutors honouring the, the students is also such an incredibly beautiful thing and, and, and doing it in a ceremonial way. Because one of the things that we also know is that Children actually really respond incredibly well to ceremony, especially when it's a ceremony that's created for them. Yeah. And, and, you know, putting these ceremonies in, my belief is that these, these, uh, these students will remember these events their whole lives. They'll remember when their parents, you know, honoured them around the fire. They'll remember when their, their school tutors who they'd had for many years uh, told them and spoke publicly publicly to them so um really really wonderful to hear about, you know your school finding all these different ways that you can bring ceremony into the into the lives of the students fantastic um i also the shout out to my really good friend katrina byrne who's uh, on the call from sydney so really fabulous to have you cat we haven't caught up for too long uh we need to do that uh, yeah that'd be fantastic so there's another community thing that I want to mention. I, I actually remembered it as I was asking you the question because um, I remember one day I came down and visited you at uh, Bishop Drew at College and every time I do, we go for a walk and you tell me about all the excitement that you're going to do down there and what you want to create in the future. So it's always, you know, lots of fun and really entertaining to come and see you, Nick. And you were speaking to me about setting up a, a fire on the school oval and calling it, I believe you were going to call it a yarning circle. 
um, and, and love to hear how that went. Yeah, so um, a, a couple of years ago now, we decided that we'd add a yarning circle to the to the school site, and this this came from a previous uh, school captain who actually put the idea forward the year before I arrived. So it had been sitting to the side for a little while, and there was a change in leadership in this school, and um, and we sat down as part of our reconciliation action action plan, and that idea came back to us in that in that grouping some 12 months later so we sat down as a as a group of staff and some students again uh, our guri ki kids were involved in that discussion to develop a yarning circle um, and so that's now been in place for a couple of years now um, and the yarning circles is just absolutely beautiful and we added to that um, over the last 18 months so now there's um, uh, ceremonial totem poles um, done by uh, groups of students of for the six houses that sit around that space. We also have a serpent um, beside the um, the yarning circle, and the serpent was put together by every student in the school putting a bead into the serpent serpent shape, and then a resin was poured over the top. So every student and every staff member in the school contributed to that real life mosaic was which is representative of the life of coffs harbour that's the 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 creek that goes through the town is is the is the serpent so that's the representation we've got here and um and further to that just in the last um last wednesday we opened our indigenous mural so we had the the beautiful auntie allison buchanan who's a um an indigenous artist from um, the nambucca valley uh, she's been working with her Guri kids to uh, to put a mural together. So we opened that just before the hailstorm on Wednesday um, that we had in town here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a fantastic opportunity. And that, and that space is used for all sorts of different um, events. Um, we use it uh, as a staff gathering point. We use it for classrooms, as an outdoor classroom. Uh, the Guri um, group who are learning... Um, their local and Gambania language. They use it as an outdoor classroom every Wednesday. Um, it's right next to our wellbeing hub. So that's another place where the kids gather for their different groupings. And we have a room inside our, our wellbeing hub that's called the Oasis Room. Um, and it's certainly that. It's a, it's a beautiful, relaxing, calm place, nice soft furnishings, um, beautiful colors, student and staff designed. Um, and all glass around the outside so it looks out over the bushland. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful spot as well. So those two spaces together um, have formed a really important central part of the school. Um, further to that, since you were visited the school and last, we've built a mountain bike track on the bit of land adjacent to the on the other side of the creek, which is connected to the school. You were just um, talking about it. You wanted to do something there. Yeah, so that uh, that uh, process has taken place. So, and once again, student involvement. So, groups of Kaizen students. So that's year uh, five, six, seven, and eight students have been building a track um, over there with a couple of teachers, and they're loving it. Um, it's part of their curriculum, as is. Uh, bike maintenance um, and safety, and then they make a track, and they and they're adding to it all the time. So hopefully, in the next uh, few months, we'll have a uh, um, a nice bridge that uh, links the the two sites together across the creek. So that's what we're working on at the moment. Gosh, Nick, it's just extraordinary to hear about all the things that you're doing and, and what you can do if you're both creative and brave, and go. We're just going to do it because this is going to be good for our students and I, and, I, and I love hearing all these amazing things that you're putting into place and, and, and it does make me reflect back on my time at school which was very very different I did go to a very good school but it was heavily academically it was all academically focused and it was all about our final year 12 mark and we know from things like research that's come out of the National University of Singapore that the year 12 mark is no the most important thing uh, that 
um, determines a student's future success. We know that mental health issues are rising, and this is pre-COVID. We're just starting to get the research out of COVID, which says it's taken it up a whole nother level again. Um, we also know that students who are having issues are still more likely to go to the internet than they are to go to someone who can actually help them. And this so-called lack of help-seeking behaviour is seen as a, as a major issue um, where we have students who it appears everything's okay on the outside, but internally it's not. And, and, and I guess the wellbeing journey that we're talking about really is about addressing what's going on internally. And, and adding to that, the McCrindle report as, uh, that came out last year tells us that uh, 95 plus percent of parents are now as interested in the wellbeing program that's happening in the school as they are in the academic outcomes. Um, you know, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Look, our, our research um, just internally. Um, as well as our communication with our with our parent body, and I, and I'm going back a couple of years here to back to 2018, but um, that research showed by far that the most important um, part of any school was well-being. Um, and parents selected a school to make sure, firstly, their their child was safe and cared for, but also was engaged. So we had an opportunity um, a few years ago now to redo our strategic plan and based upon student, staff and parent input as well as our school council, um, that message about student wellbeing and the engagement came to the forefront at every level um, and it became strategic intent number one for our strategic plan was wellbeing. Um, above academics. Um, and so it's interesting um, that um, my journey is not too dissimilar to yours, Arne, and the fact that um, it wasn't that many years ago the purpose of schooling was education only. Um, and now it's more around um, education is still vitally important, of course it is, but it's about building and supporting the growth of good citizens um, and looking after people along the way. Um, the more the students are engaged in their in their journey through schooling, the less likely they are to have well-being issues, and the more resilient they are. That doesn't mean they won't have issues. Life can, is complex and tough. We know that. Um, so we're not dismissing that, but sharing positive stories, working together, um, addressing issues as they arise, and not sweep, sweeping them under the carpet, and allowing students to have a voice. Um, and make sure that that's practiced enough so they are used to asking for help and talking to adults and they feel safe to do so. As long as we do those things, um, they won't just go to their friends and they won't just go to the internet as sources of truth. They will actually reach out to trusted adults in their world. And yeah. we want school to be that safe place always. Which is so, so important, so important. And, and, and I love you, you know, here, well, I love you, Nick, but I love hearing that <laughs> about you, that, um, you know, we've already talked about these such critical things, this importance of the sense of belonging, uh, the importance of being safe, uh, which is just such a huge thing and, and, and how much wellbeing ties into that. So for people who are, um, you know, joined us recently, please, love to see your name and and where you've joined us from and also if you have questions or, or thoughts if you want to put them in the in the comments section uh we won't necessarily be able to answer every question but if we can answer a few that'd be great fortunately unfortunately nick and i only have an hour i'm sure we could sort of speak for a, a couple of days here in what's more important than our children's well-being and and, and their future um so it's you know great to be having this conversation. We'd love to get some input from people who are listening. Nick, I, I want to stay 
with this, uh, you know, this transformative or the transformational journey, transformational education, because, you know, I think that you and I are, you know, on the same page in that, well, clearly it's not just about an external growth in terms of education and what we learn, it's very much about our, our internal journey. And um, we've talked earlier in, the, in the, uh, our discussion about building communities, but just on rites of passage and, and the journey that you've been on, I'd love for you to share a little bit about uh, that and how you've introduced rites of passage into the school and the impact that that's had. I guess the um, I'd start by um, breaking down the whole process in themes. We sat down as a um, as a group of staff up in the in the beautiful hinterland behind Byron Bay in your front yard, <laughs> um, and we we shared some stories with that group of people that were involved in that. Um, I think it might have been in May. 2018 or 2019 it's a few years ago now um but um we sat down and we discussed what was important for um our school for us to take what was already fantastic so not throwing away um all the great things that every, every school has that every school's got some fantastic practices but to say okay what are those practices let's name them let's add value to them and what are the practices that may be missing to add value for a rites of passage. Um, and, and, and let's name it and cr create some themes. So we decided that we'd sit down and, and go from kindergarten right through to, to year 12 and, and put themes together for each year level. Um, and then look at what are the practices that are important with that theme and can we link those practices to the curriculum, to school camps, to service opportunities, to leadership opportunities? How can that whole thing become um, a little bit more holistic, um, but have a pattern? That kids yeah, and just before you go on, I, I want to speak to that. Sorry, if you don't mind. I, just to say that what was great, and I remember the session so well that we did together, uh, was actually looking at these wellbeing programs and making sure that they all created one journey, you know, a coherent journey for the students. You know, we do uh, we do scopes of well-being in many schools as part of our work, and what we find is that a lot of schools have multiple well-being events, but those events don't speak to each other, and um, and and a lot of those events are just ones that they're doing because they've been done for many years and they're just part of the program. So that was a big part of our time that we had together, Nick, looking at what you were doing, if there were things that you wanted to let go of, new things you wanted to bring in and, and how we put all of that into, um, you know, an, an ongoing journey. I'll, I'll pick up a couple of different um, clusters of year groups. I probably won't list what we do in every single year group, but um, I wanted to mention sort of that year, uh, year three, four, five, um, I'll throw six into that group. So that's sort of middle to upper primary years. Um, a lot of schools will go and do a camp. Um, and then once they've done that camp, they'll come back and the kids will talk about the camp for a week. Um, the teachers will uh, flick the switch and then they'll move on to the next lot of curriculum that they've got to focus on. Um, what we wanted to do was make sure that um, any outdoor education experience had so much more value. To do and and to turn that outdoor education experience into what eventually um, has become a rite of passage for the students, but it didn't start that way. We wanted to make sure that there was um, a, a, a lead up event, a lead up process. Um, there had to be a process where there was a, a separation from that from that lead up. Um, so the whole farewelling process and going to camp needs to be recognised. Um, an opportunity to, to stretch and create some resilience. Um, having a camp um, that's just one or two days, and I'm going to be a little bit um, controversial here, you actually need the kids, in my opinion, and I've worked in outdoor education a long time now, about 30 years, um, you actually need the kids to feel a little bit uncomfortable in that 
length of camp. You want them to feel a little bit stressed, but you want them to rely on those around them to get them through that process. So it creates a bit of teamwork. It gives them an opportunity to reflect on how they're traveling. Um, it also gives us some opportunities for them to write down their thoughts and a bit of metacognition at upper primary or you know middle and upper primary year levels where they're thinking about how they're feeling and they're writing those thoughts down. They might even write, write themselves a letter to future self, that kind of stuff. That can happen at primary school years. Um, the kids are articulate enough and they're aware enough to do that, but they've got to be given the opportunity and a little tweak to create that opportunity for them to, to do that. And then, there, yes, there's some challenges. And at the end of that, some opportunities to bring them back, to share stories, to share feeling. Sometimes there's an honouring ceremony with parents. Sometimes there's an opportunity for them to share their experiences back as a group. And then when we get them back to school, we need to celebrate. But then after that, you, it can't just finish there. You have to link that back to the curriculum. And I think that's where we've come a long way um, in the last few years of um, value adding to the whole experience. So it does become a rite of passage as opposed to an outdoor education activity. Yeah. Which is kind of what we had a little bit before in some age groups. Um, yeah. What you're describing there so perfectly is actually the framework of a rite of passage, which has three stages, separation from your day-to-day -day life into a container, which your, your container is the school camp, and in that container there's a sharing of stories, challenges, creating a vision for the future, and, and, and an, and an honouring. And then the final stage is return, which is celebrated, and there has to be integration. There absolutely has to be integration so that what we take from the process doesn't just last a day or two, it actually goes into our lives moving forwards. And, and when those things are done properly, that is actually when we truly get transformation. And, and exactly like you described, and we had the discussion all those years ago about camps so often being activities-based and how we could transform not only camps but lots of events that happen in the school into transformational processes. I'm just going to pick out uh, Jane Mosco in the comment box uh, there. Um, Jane's uh, my school psychologist at BDC. Um, really, um, obviously, a passionate educator, a passionate psychologist, but also um, really up-to-date and um, agile around um, promoting student voice opportunities. Um, and I'd say the whole well-being and, and most of our school staff um, feel passionate about that too. I wanted to mention uh, some different student groups we've got in the school. I won't um, go through them all, but that we've got student groups like the Human Rights Group, um, and that they work with um, uh, a whole bunch of student-derived ideas with some staffing experts involved and some parents that are lawyers involved in there. We've got one of our parents is a, is a human rights lawyer, Kim Randall, and, um, and she comes and talks to the kids um, from the legal side, um, but they want to ma make a difference. What can they do in their world? So that's a human rights group. We've got an LGBTQI um, plus group, an environment group, um, Guri group, a round square group. Each of these groups are all derived with student voice. Yes, staff have input. Um, yes, staff take the time. Um, and there's a lot of time and energy um, put into those groups, but it's students that keep them going year to year um, and their involvement and the wonderful ideas the kids come up with. Um, the fact that we went to, um, to become a, a school that has almost a zero um, um, electricity emission um, for, for the for our school was that came from our environment group. They wanted to have an impact. They wrote to our sustainability committee on school council and we moved to solar. Um, we chose our electricity um, provider that was um, hydro. That was student voice. Um, this, the kids came and made a presentation. Um, staff involved made a presentation to the 
the sustainability committee so there can be real action um, from that our society and culture class is a stage six class um, those kids every year present a report that they then um, they write together they research it together then they present that report to the college leadership team um, and for the last three years ideas from the students from that society and culture report get added to our school improvement plan so that, the how extraordinary mm, what i'm really board. really getting the impression mm. that everything that you are doing is woven through the whole school it's not just something that happens here or here it's actually part of the culture in the school which is fantastic and there's a beautiful comment from uh jenny booth who is pro i assume is at bishop Druitt, saying how lucky it is to be k-12 to because it allows a journey to build strength and culminate within the safety of community so that the students do step out of their comfort zone but with the knowing we are all there support and grow and so there's that combination of transformational education being made up of healthy communities and events and the community actually holding that event uh, and 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 if it's a rite of passage event uh, because it's done within community it genuinely allows them to step out of comfort zone and by the way rites of passage don't just have to be done on camps but, you know the, the children who write up about the solar power or, or you know are involved in all these different groups that's they they're going through a, a transformation and it's a rite of passage for them as well so that's a very uh powerful way of demonstrating the work that you're doing there look it's a, it is a journey where like like all schools where we can always improve our practice um and um but i am blessed um Arne, with a dedicated staff who are genuinely on that journey with me wanting to make our school as positive as we can to help those kids and it's yeah. that's our kids first mentality is is part of that key yeah and wouldn't it be fabulous if we could get every school you know on, on a similar trajectory so so i want to ask you nick what about you know this all sounds fantastic i know it's fantastic you know it's fantastic but you know what about do you have any research that you've done or how do you actually demonstrate to to parents to the to the board uh to whoever that what you're doing is working that's a good question um some of it's uh that visceral feeling um some of it can be measured through surveys um some of it can be um measured through reduced incidences of of certain types of behavior and we and we do all those things um but how we report that to parents really is for that continuous engagement to occur to let them know that yes like all schools we still have mandatory reports that happen um, we still have um, critical incidents happen we had a, a a critical incident on wednesday it wasn't student related it was a uh, um, an act of God um, about four inches of hail came out of this out of the sky and landed on the school in about 20 minutes but um, one thing that you I, I know I noticed straight away um, as soon as that event happened um, and we we're talking about it as a staff meeting this afternoon online is staff immediately gravitated towards their line manager or a team member in the school and how can i help how can i get involved um i encourage people to jump onto the school's facebook site and have a look at the cleanup um there was people sweeping there was people making I sure saw you out there the with right room, mate. <laughs> yes I, I was really bit quite worried the kids would um would fall over on the slippery surface but anyway um but everyone engaged um the amount of phone calls and emails were received the next day saying can we come on to site and help clean up um we had we sent staff out to other staff members houses to, to help with the cleanup so we had about 10 or 11 staff who their homes were um you know parts of roofs roofs destroyed backyards decimated um hail going into the into their living rooms 
uh, and we had staff out there helping each other. It, that sense of community is very, very important. Um, so I guess it, it can be measured through surveys. And yes, we do those surveys. Like we did the perspective survey from AIS New South Wales. Um, we do some of those wellbeing surveys as they come along and we track that data. Um, we keep um, uh, a log of, um, uh, I guess, incidences of reporting particular behaviours. Uh, and that's something that we can improve on as well. Um, we've moved to um, from our, our current student management system to, to Schoolbox in the last couple of years. And I know that um, one of the Schoolbox representatives is on this uh, line at the moment. And um, one of the reasons we went to that particular format is so that we could uh, measure some of those things a little bit more accurately and be able to extract that data uh, real time. Um, so we can always improve our practices around that measuring side and reporting yeah. side. Um, yeah. We all can. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one of the problems with being so keen to do stuff is uh, that the, the, the research and anything, unfortunately, doesn't always take top priority. But it's great to hear the stuff that you are doing. Now, we've got about 10 minutes left. So... Um, very keen if anybody's got any comments or questions in this last 10 minutes and also a couple of things that we're offering uh, we're very much in the, the rights of passage institute um, uh, looking always looking for ways that we can support relationships between parents and children um, and we uh, have something that we normally set we're offering free tonight a booklet on how to parent teenagers so we'll put a link up there and if anybody is interested in a free copy of our booklet on how to parent teenagers and actually the principles in it are the same as you know for, for young children so anybody who's interested in that link we'll put that up in the in the chat box and anybody who's interested in knowing more about our work um, we'll also put up the website to the rights of passage institute because very much our aim is to be working in schools and supporting schools to be doing exactly what you're doing nick um, and a, a really important question from Ross Harold about um, who's also excited they're going to dive into the journey. Where I'm not sure what school Ross is at, but that's fantastic to hear. But he, he's asking how you manage the push and pull between curriculum demands and the space and time for transitional rights or passage opportunities and the other things that you've been talking about. That is a good question, Nan, and um, the answer to that is different in every state. Um, we're in New South Wales and NESS is our accreditation body and they're quite strict around hours of curriculum time. Whereas um, I've also been a deputy in Queensland and a principal in Western Australia and the, um, the strictness of curriculum hours and the ability to do other sort of exciting things outside of the norm um, are much easier in those two states. So you have to play smarter, <laughs> not harder, to make sure that occurs. So when you're looking at your curriculum, you need to say, okay, well, if, if we're going to do these activities, how is that going to fit in with the curriculum? How can we value add to that? Does it match against the PDHPE curriculum? Um, with respectful relationships, for example. Um, like we did some work um, earlier this year with respectful relationships um, with you and Kat, and um, that aligns to the PDHPE curriculum. It's not, a day, it's not a half a day out or a day out, it's PE curriculum. Mm. Um, so we just really need to make sure that when we're looking at those things, we say, okay, this isn't a special day, or this isn't an activity that has no value outside of the norm, it's not, a, it's not just for the tradition, it's not just for the rites of passage, it has a link to the curriculum. But you need to know your curriculum and to see how it can be embedded. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. And Ross, Ross Harold is from Side Christian College who we actually spoke to yesterday. So, hey Ross, thanks for being on the call. Um, and a very important question also from Tim Moore about, you know, what are some of the barriers you have needed to overcome in establishing this work because what you're doing is not it's not normal um, you know you've been called there that before, before. <laughs> you, you what did you say I said I've been called that before <laughs> yeah but, um, but 
you know, and, and anybody who wants to change culture and bring in something new, that that's not something that everybody automatically says, great, do it and thanks you for it. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really important question about what, what would you say, Nick, are some of the obstacles and barriers that you've had to come overcome in doing all of this? Anytime you manage change, whether it be curriculum-based or co-curricular activities or um, restructuring or, or changing anything, um, anytime there's change, there's going to be people that are early adopters and excited by change. And there's going to be those people that are reluctant to change or change fine is fine unless it happens to me kind of attitude. Um, so in order to put any sort of change out, to remove some of those obstacles is to add more people to your camp. And the only way to do that is to provide multiple opportunities to share why there's an imperative to change. Um, and so that's... And, and often people want to change, they just don't know what they want to change to. So creating as many different opportunities as you can with students, with staff, with parents too, on sharing um, what they want out of their school and what outcomes they want for their children. And by far and away, what all, our whole community wanted for our school was having students that were... Um, strong on the soft skills. They wanted them to be resilient. They wanted them to be adaptable. They wanted them to be connected to others. Um, they wanted them to be self-aware. And so with those soft skills at the center, all of those rites of passage build human capacity. And so once they identified that they wanted soft skills, well, the rites of passage helped deliver those soft skills. So this yeah. became the vehicle to deliver what they wanted. Yeah. Um, so look, once once we had explained that process, um, we really haven't had too many naysayers, to be honest. Most people yeah. just wanted some time to get their head around it and then some time to, to prepare for it. And we're on a journey, like all schools. Yeah. And it's interesting, those soft skills that you mentioned, I spoke about the that came out of the National University of Singapore saying that the year 12 mark is not the uh, most important and, and only indicator of a student's future success. And they identified these nine 21st century life skills and, and which very, you know, completely include the ones that you've said, resilience, adaptability, curiosity, uh, engagement, emotional intelligence, a growth yeah. mindset, yeah, all, all of which... Uh, can be delivered through rites of passage and through the welfare programs that you are speaking of, which is fantastic. And, and then Deb T asked a question about whether it's possible to run the program outside of the school um, for, well, to avoid the need for administrative approval, but also just because if someone's not at the, a school which has it, is it possible to do this? And, and, and absolutely it is. And, and there are you know, I've been involved in rites of passage work for 25 years and I used to be a doctor originally and, and left that to set up rites of passage programs and I'm very proud to say that there are rites of passage programs happening all over Australia, including a group down in the Coffs Harbour um, uh, Ballingen area. Uh, and if people are interested, they can come onto our website, the Rites of Passage Institute. We're always happy to share with people about where rites of passage are occurring. And we also run rites of passage leadership training about the framework uh, of a rite of passage. So if people are interested in learning that and, and then want to look at taking that into their families, their communities, their schools or their workplaces, uh, you know, our, our vision is to have rites of passage in the mainstream once again. Uh, so, Arnold, yeah. can I yeah. add to that a little bit? Uh, look, a number of my staff have done the level one training uh, the, the leadership course now. Um, and I have a, a, a backlog of staff that have put their hand up to uh, to do that over the last couple of years. So I think we've got seven that are, that are trained now. Um, and I would have another five or six that are keen to, to go and, and be involved. So we, we'll continue in that process to, um, 
to train staff because I think that that's an important part of the whole process. And it certainly is transferable outside of the school setting. It doesn't have to be just for adolescents. I'm a big believer that growth is continual and um, learning is lifelong. And so it doesn't have to be aimed at adolescents or children. The, the skills that you learn through that process, it was certainly affirming for the group that I took up there, which had, um, which had some members of my CLT. It had um, um, one of my outdoor educators in that group. We all became closer because of that experience and we all learnt things about each other that we didn't know. Um, people shared vulnerable stories that um, have become very important in our relationship building. Uh, so I think that it's got value outside of the school setting or outside of the child and adolescent setting. Great. Thank you, Nick. And uh, we're out of time. Um, and I would like to finish uh, by just doing a bit of an honouring of you, Nick, uh, and uh, as part of my thank you for your being on here. And, and um, you know, I hope that everybody who's listening tonight uh, you know, has had a chance to hear about some of the amazing stuff that you've done at Bishop Druitt College. But but I, I want to honour you on another number of other levels. Um, first of all, I see you as a real visionary uh, in this in this area, and you know you, you had a vision to really create something special at Bishop Druitt College, and you've made it happen. And yes, you do need a team to do that. You do need all of these things. You also need a leader, and I believe that you have really magnificently led your team, created professional development opportunities for them, and then given them the space to go and do these things. And, and I really admire that and I honour that, and, and I've seen the transformation that Bishop Druitt has undergone in the last few years, and I think they are incredibly lucky to have you there. Uh, but aside from that... Thank you. I also want to honour you as a family man and I know how important uh, your family, your, your wife and your children are to you and, and uh, I've met your, your family and um, I, I really honour the energy and effort that you put in with them and the support that you create there despite having such an incredibly busy job. Uh, and then I honour that you're into, you know, the, Whilst this is such a big part of your life, you love your music. I'm always seeing um, posts about you going to various festivals and often taking, you know, different members of the family and um, getting out and about doing that stuff. So thank you, Nick. You're, you're, you're a great man. You're a great friend and you're doing something really uh, fabulous and extraordinary. That will be transforming the lives of the students who, and the staff who are in your care so thanks for being you nick and i uh, look forward to when we next meet thanks Arne. appreciate it thanks the time everybody thank, thank you for joining us tonight and um what a what a great pleasure to to uh have the opportunity to do this as part of our our work here at the rights of passage institute good night everybody good night <laughs>